Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Satu LeMay. I'm the Vice President of the East West Center and delighted to have you here this afternoon. I know a couple of other things are going on on Capitol Hill today, uh, but delighted that you could join us and thank you for your time and uh, interest in this launch of Japan Matters for America, America Matters for Japan. We have been honored and grateful to work with the Sasakawa Peace Foundation in this partnership on over, that has ranged for several years now on this joint publication that maps the importance of the U.S.-Japan relationship both in the United States and in Japan at the national, state, and local level. There is no United States relationship with any country in the world which is as deep, wide-ranging at the national, state, and local level as the U.S.-Japan relationship across commercial sectors, educational sectors, people-to-people -people sectors, and not at all least but important diplomacy, values, interests, security, defense. And so we're really proud to bring this publication forth every uh, couple of years to update and refresh the understanding of Japan and the US relationship in the context of great change in the international environment and in our two countries. Today, we have a terrific lineup of officials, experts to speak on the relationship and um, their full bios are in the materials that we've provided you. Um, you can download the PDF publication uh, by scanning on the form that we gave you in the link, and you will see a publication that looks something like this. Uh, but you can save some paper and have it on your phone or on your iPad or on your computer. Um, in the course of this program, we'll have a few keynote remarks. And then we will go to three panel sessions, fireside chats, with real experts on the various facets of the relationship, people to people, security and defense, and the commercial ties. But first, um, I want to thank um, the Sasakawa Foundation. I want to thank the Embassy of Japan for its support for this launch event. Um, I want to thank our team at the East West Center, led by Spencer Gross and a whole host of our colleagues for producing this uh, publication on our side. And I'm sure our SPF colleagues will speak to their team. So without further ado, let me introduce our partner in this effort, Sasakawa Peace Foundation's Ms. Aya Murata. Please, Aya. Good afternoon. Uh, distinguished honor, uh, members of Congress and honored ambassadors. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, participating in uh, this event today. I am Aya Murata, Director of Japan News Program of the Sasaka Peace Foundation. Uh, I am here today uh, to uh, give a message um, on behalf of our president, Dr. Tsunami, Atushi Tsunami, uh, uh, who was unfortunately, uh, unfortunately uh, not coming uh, to this event. Uh, today, but he wanted to extend his uh, warm wishes to all of you. So uh, let me uh, um, pass the uh, his messages. So to celebrate uh, the completion of the new version of the booklet, I like first uh, express my sincere thanks to Dr. Asatu Rimeye and East West Center's uh, team for being our great owner. Um, a uh, great partner in this project uh, and for arranging this uh, today's great event. And I'm sorry for not uh, being there today. East West Center and SBF uh, first collaborated on this Japan Matters project in 2009 and 2010. And since then, uh, 13 years have uh, passed and the international environment has changed dramatically. But it is with great pleasure that we have been able to work together more firmly than ever before, actually, uh, on this new version. So as we have known, the unique concept of this Asia Matters series is the variety of ways in which uh, interdependence uh, between the two countries uh, is highlighted in a single volume and providing a multi-layered perspectives on the depths, interest, and evolution of the bilateral relationship. In keeping with the current trends and changing environment, uh, this new version also covers new topics, including uh, semiconductors, space cooperation, and the COVID-19 uh, vaccination, and so on, all those efforts. Uh, further, 
at the Bansing US Japan Corporation in the area of science and technology innovation, uh, including space, cyber, AI, uh, and other emerging technologies, are something I have been uh, advising our government for many years. And with the recent signing of the Japan US Framework Agreement on Space Cooperation, uh, during Prime Minister Kishida's visit uh, to the United States, which include also cooperation on the Artemis problem, space cooperation is receiving increasing attention. We also have seen in the news that the uh, NASA chief, um, Mr. Nelson, has just uh, met our Prime Minister Kishida on Monday uh, this week. So in the area of education and human connection, the Sasaka Peace Foundation has started a scholarship program uh, for Japanese prospective students to do their undergraduate studies in the US. And Sasaka Peace Foundation USA uh, is also implementing uh, what we call the JUMP program to connect current and former military personnel in the United States who have been stationed at the US forces in Japan uh, before. So uh, SPF has been uh, collaborating on this Japan Matters for America project for years because we believe that each person who picks up this booklet, each person uh, who touches the information, whether they are a public audience or a, a policy a professional, can find new insights and perspectives and new ways of looking at the japan US relationship. So it may be obvious, but I believe that our efforts to understand each other more deeply and to the innovative our relationship are the most important core of the Japanese relations to grow uh, into a relationship that can make a greater contribution to a world in this changing and unpredictable era. So I think providing this like a go-to resource uh, for understanding Japanese relations through this publication is one of the important efforts we can make. Uh, in closing, I'd like to thank everyone again for uh, coming to this event, and I'd like to conclude my remarks at Shisunami, president of the Sasaka Peace Foundation. And at the end, I'd like to also thank uh, to my team, as Tatu mentioned, uh, Takuya Tazawa and Yuta Sano, uh, and Etsuko Oshita, who translated uh, uh, this document into Japanese. Uh, she's in Japan now. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for your attention. Let me welcome, and I hope you'll join me in welcoming our president of the East-West Center, who's come out from Honolulu, Hawaii, to join us today, Major General Retired Suzanne Verislam. Suzanne? Aloha and good afternoon to everyone. What an honor and privilege it is to be here from Honolulu, Hawaii, with our esteemed and senator from Hawaii's own, Senator Maisie Hirono. Thank you so much, Senator, for being here. And of course, Ambassador Tomita, thank you so much. And Deputy Assistant Secretary, thank you. And all of our distinguished guests who are here um, to join because Japan matters for America and America matters for Japan. It is clear in the statistics alone, as you'll see on that QR code from the amazing uh, partnership with our East West Center staff and Sasakawa Foundation. Thank you so much. It's a long time waiting. I remember actually visiting Ambassador Tamita early last year to tell you about Japan Matters, and here we are today, Ambassador. And thank you for coming to Hawaii to share the role that Hawaii plays in that bridge, the role that all the states and territories play in being that bridge and connection to Japan and that long-term alliance. And it was really a thrill to have the Senator Hirono here because you know we honored her at our Women of Courage. And it was at that event that we had, and I hope you don't mind Senator sharing, that you're a fifth grade teacher who was there as well after you came from Japan to Hawaii. And then now rising up from a young girl in that classroom to being a senior leader, making change and being a voice for many people and also a bridge to this US-Japan alliance. It has been uh, just an honor just to see words cannot put, ex fully express the kinds of people-to-people -people connections we have on top of the amazing job creation, investment, exchange, tourism, education, sister city partnerships. We can go down that list, but it's really the people-to-people -people connections that matter, which is really when Eisenhower signed the authorization in 1960 of the establishment of the East-West Center 
really had that vision that it would be about the people. And, you know, just my own personal story, having served at Indo-Pacific Command and having seen, participated in many of these exercises that are outlined, Keen Edge, the Yamasakura exercise in 1989 in Hokkaido, to later on participating and seeing the depth and breadth of this relationship. And the, the, you're going to hear so much more from our amazing speakers, so I don't want to take away from them, but just to say that the fact that all of you are here and that we're recording it now so that we can share it with others, we have an amazing tool to explain to both our countries why we matter for each other. So thank you so much for being here. And uh, Satu, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you, Susie. And, and thanks for your support of the Asia Matters for America initiative. And thank you for your leadership of the East West Center. Um, uh, I can just say that Major General Retired Varislam is just celebrating her first year anniversary as president of the East West Center. So thank you, Susie. We now turn to our featured speaker. Um, and uh, first, uh, before we go to the others, is of course, Senator Hirono, who not only has supported this effort, but spoke at previous launch events and was so gracious with her staff in supporting a room tonight uh, for us to meet. Um, but more importantly, really for her leadership on a range of issues for the state of Hawaii, for the United States, for our relations with the Indo-Pacific region in her service on the Armed Services Committee and others, Senator Maisie Hirono. Minasama, konnichiwa. I am uh, really glad to be here with all of you today. And I hope, as I mentioned to Ambassador Tomita, I hope you notice that I am wearing a Japanese shibori jacket made from a kimono. And that's part of my background and my culture. So I decided that I would wear that, uh, wear this today. We are here to celebrate the East West Center's latest report Japan matters for America, America matters for Japan. I think that says it all. The strength of the re relationship is, uh, is critically important to our two countries in so many ways. And yes, the one that I probably am most familiar with as a member of the, the uh, Senate Armed Services Committee is, yes, the military to military relationship but obviously we share so many more areas of concern. And I particularly want to uh, give a special mahalo to my friend Susie Varislam, who is the new president of the East West Center. And as the first woman and first uh, Native Hawaiian person uh, to hold the, this role, and as a retired Major General, Susie, you cover a lot of uh, basis, I have to say, that you do bring a unique perspective in helping the center evolve in an ever-changing world. I also want to, of course, acknowledge Ambassador Tomita. It was lovely to see you um, several months ago uh, at your residence and uh, all of our other distinguished guests. And we in Hawaii are proud of the East-West Center and, the, and its work to promote cooperation and understanding across countries, our two countries and cultures. And, and I, I know, Susie, under your leadership, there is going to be so much more that will be done under the leadership of the East West Center and you. And of course, that it, this includes areas of research, such as the new report on issues affecting our countries and communities throughout the Indo-Pacific. And as the first and only immigrant uh, born in Japan, in the United States Senate, I, like many of you, have long understood the very special relationship between the United States and Japan and how critical that relationship is to peace, security, and prosperity of the entire Indo-Pacific region. And that includes our strong, as I mentioned, decades of military alliance, but also the, to uh, continue to strengthen our deep concerns or connections across a full spectrum of issues, as mentioned by uh, East West Center presidents in the areas of education, cultural exchanges, tourism, trade, and more. And this is especially true for Hawaii, which welcomes more visitors from Japan than any other state in the country. I think that's right, right? Even California. 
Yeah, millions and millions of Japanese uh, tourists come to Hawaii and, and uh, uh, help us in, in that way. Uh, and the strong ties enabling our countries to better combat some of the more pressing challenges we face from climate change, illegal fishing, human trafficking, regional stability. I look forward to our country's continued collaboration as we work to advance democracy throughout the Pacific region, a mission I know the East West Center uh, understands and supports. So once again, thank you all, minasama, domo arigatou gozaimasu, and we shall go forward. Aloha. Thank you very much indeed, Senator Hirono, for making time today. I know this is a particularly busy day uh, here on the Hill, and um, um, thank you for your presence and your remarks. Um, we now turn to another featured speaker, which is who is Ambassador Koji Tomita. We have uh, very grateful for the support of your embassy. Uh, as many of you know from the bio material sent to you, Ambassador Tomita is one of the most experienced Japanese diplomats. He served in the United States before and now as ambassador. We welcome you. Please, over to you, sir. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Um, it is a great pleasure uh, to join in the launch event of the uh, the fourth update of the uh, report on vital ties. And this is a wonderful uh, booklet, as you all agree, but uh, what I most like it about is its title. Um, Japan Matters for America, and America Matters for Japan, which should be a mantra for any Japanese ambassador. So you don't mind uh, sharing a copyright with me, would you, Susie? <laughs> and just last week, I uh, visited Honolulu uh, for the first time as ambassador. As always, I found Hawaii to be uh, uh, beautiful and the Hawaiians to be remarkably friendly and welcoming throughout my visit. I would be uh, lying if I said I, that I didn't hesitate a little bit when I stepped onto the plane to return to Washington. So, um, Senator Hirono, who just left, uh, you very nearly gained a new constituent. <laughs> but I visited uh, uh, the headquarters of the Student Center and uh, my time with uh, Susie and uh, her talented team uh, renewed my appreciation for the center, which since 1960, has made so many significant contributions to connect the United States and Asia from their beautiful campus right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And uh, of course, one of these uh, uh, efforts is this report compiled and revised with a collaboration uh, of the Sasagawa Peace Foundation. I am among many people in this room who have been eagerly awaiting this update since the last uh, uh, edition four years ago. Its usefulness as a reliable source of basic information about Japan-US relations cannot be overstated. I commend this work to everyone interested in this important bilateral tie. But the significance of the new edition released today is that it provides a vivid summary of the ways that Japan's relationship has deepened, including at the state and local levels, and especially over the past four years, despite all the challenges we experienced during this period, including the global pandemic. And we very much welcome these positive developments, but an important thing is to remind ourselves what is behind all the statistics. We must remember there are real people behind, the, behind them working tirelessly for the connections and exchanges captured in this booklet. So when I see the number of Japanese gardens in the US, for instance, I remember the people I met at the Portland Japan Japanese Garden uh, who are not just taking care of the best Japanese garden in the US, but also mentoring the new generation of 
gardeners using their facilities. And when I see the, the amount of Japanese direct investment, I remember the people I met at the Toyota plant in Georgetown in Kentucky, who take a great pride in producing more than 500,000 cars a year, but also in making contributions to local community through employment and philanthropy. And when I see the uh, number of sister city relations, I remember Hawaii has six state sister state relationships with six different prefectures, and as well as sister city relationships with 26 different cities, each representing the long and rich history of human connections that, that exist between the, the island state and Japan. So this new edition is not just a snapshot of the great partnership we, enjoy, we enjoy today, but uh, it's a testament to the dedication of all the people, past and present, who made this happen. And uh, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to express my deep respect and appreciation to all of them. And uh, speaking, finally, speaking of human connections, I would also like to mention how privileged I felt when I witnessed the great connections our two leaders displayed during their recent meeting here in DC. Between Prime Minister Kishida and President Biden, there is genuine rapport and mutual trust, which serve as an invaluable fund foundation as we try to further strengthen our partnership. Indeed, if I may propose a slight modification to the slogan, Japan matters for America and America matters for Japan, I would add, our partnership matters for the world. And this sense of shared responsibility was clearly evident when the two leaders discussed our common challenges from Ukraine to climate change. And as we take on these challenges, I take a great encouragement from this booklet. So thank you very much once again uh, for inviting me to this wonderful event. Thank you very much. We've been talking about the publication itself and the fact that you can download it and, and get a hard copy uh, before long. We'll have it circulated around Congress, but I would urge you to visit the Japan Matters for America website, which has all the people to people stories and the connections that many of our young professionals uh, curate and write. And they really bring to life some of those ongoing connections rather than just the data or just the infographics, but really the stories and soon videos that we will have. Well, let me now turn to the next section of our program, which is keynote remarks from a number of people who are deeply involved at the policy level um, and in elected office in our uh, government service. Um, the first is um, we just uh, uh, had Representative Castro arrive. And as many of you know, he's been the co-chair of the Japan Caucus here on the, in the House and has been a longtime supporter of our efforts both on ASEAN and on Japan. And may I invite Representative Castro to make some remarks. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you, Zatu, for that kind introduction. And thank you for acknowledging the incredible work of the U.S.-Japan Caucus over the last almost 10 years now. And thank you to your team at the East-West Center and the staff at the Sasakawa Peace Foundation for your work to put this excellent report together once again. And as the title says, Japan Matters for America. The significance of the U.S.-Japan relationship is especially clear after a very eventful few months. With the historic updates to Japan's national defense strategy in December, followed by Prime Minister Kishida's visit to Washington, D.C. last month, our alliance, I believe it's safe to say, is stronger than ever. We see that not only from engagement among political leaders, but also from the work you do every day to support the bilateral relationship here and in communities across the country. I always look forward to the release of a new edition of Japan Matters for America because it's a great resource for all of us who look to tell the story of our incredible bilateral relationship, including the members of the U.S.-Japan Caucus, which I'm proud to co-chair with Rep. Adrian Smith. As the report details, J Japanese companies support more than a million jobs in the United States, including more than 74,000 jobs in my home state of Texas. 
The United States is the top destination for Japanese investment worldwide, and we have a thriving trade relationship with about $279 billion in annual trade. Our relationship is the cornerstone of Indo-Pacific security and a broader vision of a, of a free and open Indo-Pacific supported by re regional architecture like the Quad and close cooperation with the United States and other partners on development as well. Japan has shown itself to be a strong partner in upholding a rules-based international order around the world, particularly following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I'm glad to see Japan return to the United Nations Security Council for a two-year term as a non-permanent member this year, and I echo President Biden's support for Japan to eventually be included as a permanent member as discussions of Security Council reform continue. But we're here not just to capture a snapshot of this bilateral relationship, but to continue to adapt and elevate that alliance to face and take on new challenges. We're working together to set and maintain robust standards for future trade, both in the Indo-Pacific region and around the world. I also believe that we can cooperate effectively to build secure supply chains for semiconductors and other critical items to ensure our alliance remains at the technological cutting edge. We continue to invest in allied capabilities that will strengthen deterrence in the Indo-Pacific and extending that deterrence to new domains like space to prevent a disruption of the satellite infrastructure that our defensive capabilities and many aspects of our daily lives depend on. We will, quite literally, bring our alliance to new heights with the new framework agreement on the peaceful exploration of outer space. Closer to Earth, of course, I also look forward to Japan's presidency of the G7 this year. The future of our alliance is bright, and so long as the United States and Japan continue to work together, I'm confident that together we can make the future of the wider world brighter as well. Thank you so much for all of your work and your investment in this incredible relationship. Thank you. In the spirit of some of the items that the Congressman mentioned, uh, we now turn to our next speaker, Dr. Siddharth Mohandas, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State uh, of Defense for East Asia uh, in the uh, Indo-Pacific Security Affairs at the Department of Defense. Uh, Siddharth has had a long uh, experience in the U.S. government, including on the policy planning staff, and now serves in the Deputy Assistant Secretary role. Thanks very much, Satu, and thank you all uh, uh, for being here today and for the opportunity uh, to speak. And in particular, thank you to the East-West Center and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation for hosting this important event. And my congratulations as well on the launch of the Japan Matters for America, America Matters for Japan report. Uh, it is a very important and valuable uh, uh, booklet that you have put out. We're all here today because we believe uh, in the U.S.-Japan alliance and the extraordinary benefits uh, it provides the citizens of both our countries. You've already heard from uh, other distinguished speakers uh, about different facets of that relationship. And what I'd like to talk about today is the defense relationship, uh, a relationship that keeps our two countries safe and contributes profoundly to the stability of the Indo-Pacific and the broader world. It's also an important time for that relationship. I'm pleased to be speaking with you soon uh, after President Biden and Prime Minister Kishida met at the White House uh, last month, as well as the immensely productive and uh, indeed historic uh, U.S.-Japan Security Consultative Committee meeting, or 2 plus 2 meeting, featuring our Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense and their Japanese counterparts uh, earlier uh, in January as well. Uh, these engagements build on Japan's new national security strategy and new defense uh, strategy documents, uh, which included announcing a doubling of Japan's defense budget over five years, as well as the acquisition of important new capabilities. Following the release of our own U.S. national security strategy and national defense strategy, I think I can confidently say the alignment between our two countries has never been greater. Uh, my boss, Secretary Austin, often speaks of Japan and the U.S.-Japan alliance as the cornerstone of peace and security in the Indo-Pacific. Today, I'd like to talk to you briefly about why that is, what we've achieved as an alliance, and where we go from here. Uh, let me begin with shared values and shared vision. The United States and Japan both champion a vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific and a rules-based international order. 
Our alliance is committed to sh protecting the shared values that underpin that, and in doing so, supporting regional and global peace and stability. The U.S.-Japan alliance is also fundamental to U.S. defense strategy, as the United States and Japan face an unprecedented level of challenges in the Indo-Pacific and beyond. Russia's unlawful invasion of Ukraine, uh, aggressive and coercive PRC behavior, uh, including around the Taiwan Strait and the East and South China Seas, as well as provocative and dangerous activity by the DPRK, um, all are challenging uh, the security order in the Indo-Pacific today. This increasingly complex security environment is felt acutely by Japan, and at our two most uh, at our most recent uh, two plus two meeting, uh, we made clear our unwavering commitment to the defense of Japan, including our extended deterrence commitment. We voiced our op opposition to any unilateral changes to the status quo and reiter reiterated the importance of maintaining peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. For the United States. Our allies and partners are our greatest long-term advantage, and that is why uh, we are committed to strengthening the U.S.-Japan alliance. So let me just say a word briefly about how we're doing that. Uh, and that really comes out of uh, uh, the 2 plus 2 meeting that just concluded in January. At that meeting, Secretary Austin, Secretary Blinken, Japanese Minister Hamada, and Minister Hayashi announced a number of extremely important initiatives. First, they welcomed a historic alliance decision to optimize U.S. force posture in Japan by forward stationing more versatile, mobile, and resilient capabilities, including our most advanced Marine Corps ground formation. These actions will bolster deterrence and allow us to defend Japan and its people more effectively. Second, they strongly endorsed Japan's new national security documents, including the increase in Japanese defense spending, as well as new capabilities, such as the acquisition of a counter-strike capability. Third, they uh, advanced discussions on updating the roles and missions for the alliance to bolster uh, deterrence and actively engage in maintaining regional peace and security. Our efforts to modernize roles and missions bring the alliance more firmly into the 21st century and ensure that the United States and Japan are acting shoulder to shoulder in our common defense. Looking beyond the bilateral relationship, we resolve to jointly strengthen alliance activities with allies and partners within and beyond the Indo-Pacific, including crucially Australia and the Republic of Korea. As a result of these decisions, our alliance stands stronger than ever. Looking ahead, we see many promising areas of defense cooperation and diplomatic engagement for the alliance. This includes deepening our defense industrial and advanced technology cooperation, securing our supply chains, enhancing joint training and interoperability, and working with like-minded allies and partners on shared goals, including strengthening global and regional institutions. Our defense cooperation agenda for the alliance works hand in glove with our economic leadership agenda, and as we strive to uphold a free, fair, and rules-based economic order, which will be a key feature and key objective of Japan's presidency of the G7, as well as the United States hosting of APEC. As I said, we are more aligned than ever today. So now we must do the hard work of implementing the vision of our leaders agreed upon in January to achieve a new era for the US-Japan uh, alliance. We're excited about that charge. We we'll look forward to working closely with our Japanese allies, and we're looking forward to getting to work. Thank you very much. We are uh, happily joined now by Representative Jill Takuda, who represents um, uh, Kaneohe and Kailua on the island of Oahu, Oahu from Hawaii. So Representative Takuda, please welcome. Good afternoon and aloha. Very good. That's the response we want to hear. It's uh, quite an honor to be part of such a distinguished group gathered here today to recognize, in my humble opinion, one of the most important bilateral relationships in the world. I'm a Yonsei, fourth generation Uchinanchu, whose great grandparents immigrated from the villages of Oroku, Kushikawa, Tomikushku, and Goaku over a hundred years ago in search of a better life, working the plantations in Hawaii. On my last visit to Okinawa, I remember walking out of the plane and being met by a sign that says, Oka'erinasai, 
welcome home. And even though our family uh, was generations removed from this place, I will tell you that it did in fact feel just like that, like we were home. I share this with you because my story as to why Japan matters to me is deeply personal why I am committed to supporting and building on the critical alliance and friendship between the United States and Japan is deeply personal. I want to thank Suzy Veris Lam, Satu Limaye, and the entire team at the East West Center for their hard work and personal commitment to pull together the fourth edition of Japan Matters for America, America Matters for Japan. I will tell you, I am a very big data wonk, so I can appreciate fully the amount of time and energy it has taken not only to compile all of these different strands of data together, but also present them in a meaningful, understandable, and most importantly, a usable way. Now consider this, and I know most of you already know this, 1.6 million Japanese Americans live in the United States. 430,000 Japanese nationals are living in the United States and 160,000 Americans live in Japan. And there are nearly 466 sister partnerships between United States and Japan across our country. Now with this kind of global presence and across our country, the alliance and relationship between our two countries and its people touch every state, territory and province in each of our countries. Now again, being that self-professed data wonk, I wanted to gather some qualitative data to compare against the robust quantitative data that are going to be included in these reports. And so I took the liberty of asking a few of my fellow freshman classmates in Congress, what comes to mind when I say Japan? Now I will tell you, I expected sushi, food, all kinds of crazy little answers, but the responses I got included my niece. She lives there, my district. I have large numbers of Japanese Americans, many of whom had family members who were interned. One of America's strongest allies, an economic force and stable partner, strategic partner and ally. I can tell you with 100% certainty that these members of Congress had not yet seen a Japan Matters report. And yet with just a simple unprompted question, they hit almost all of the primary indicators used to define the relationship between our two countries. Imagine the power and the potential if we were to support what these members of Congress know with the facts that they need to elevate and strengthen mutually beneficial relationships with Japan. The Japan Matters series is a powerful tribute to this relationship between two great countries that have been anchors of general peace and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region for almost 80 years. And while that in and of itself is a huge asset, this publication is one of a series, as you know, focused on the entire Indo-Pacific region. When you look at the series as a whole, you quickly get a picture of the intricate network of political, economic, social, and cultural ties that connect the United States with this region. That network has been the foundation of the Indo-Pacific peace and prosperity that China increasingly challenges with its growing military and economic aggression. The United States, Japan, and all of our allies and partners in the region must adapt quickly to the challenges being posed to us by the PRC, Russia, and North Korea. The national security strategies that the United States and Japan released last year highlight the perilous nature of the regional security environment and embrace new directions in doctrine and policy needed to uphold regional peace, security, and prosperity. The important takeaway for all of our partners and neighbors in the region is our national security strategies are built on commitments to shared values in freedom, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. The Asia Matters for America series and the generations of close ties between Hawaii, the United States, and Japan highlight the fact that beyond the numbers that we see, people, people, real people are at the core of this peaceful and stable regional order we are working so diligently to protect. We must not underestimate the people-to-people -people relationships we have fostered through business and trade, educational and cultural exchange, and economic and social development programs. Through these efforts, we have built a more civil society and reinforced shared values and norms that strengthen our democracies. As a representative for Hawaii and a member of the House Armed Services Committee, went to my first committee hearing today, by the way, I know that there is much work to do if we are all to join together to protect what matters most. Thank you again for including me in this auspicious event. I look forward to cracking it open and getting to all the good data in there, uh, but most importantly, look forward to working with each and one of you going forward. Mahalo.
May I invite the first uh, set of panelists, uh, Dr. Michael Oslin, Jim Schof is here, and Mr. Isozaki, please. So I'd really like to ask each of you in turn to just lay out your thinking about where the state of the U.S.-Japan security relationship is today. Um, I'd like you to highlight some of the great things that are happening, but also some of the things that we have to work on as we go forward to continue to build the alliance, starting with Misha Asla. Oh, Satu, thank you. I'm glad it's not scripted. I don't have script. So uh, this will be just a few thoughts uh, and, and comments. And you know, actually, my, um, my colleagues on the panel can speak uh, much better than I can to some of the more granular and, and concrete issues about uh, the state of the security relationship and where we need to be going. Um, I actually was thinking of it in, a little bit in terms of a, of a cultural perspective. I mean, let's be honest, you know, for a long time, it's been a little bit boring reading about Japan because you read the same names over and over, right? You'd read Shof, you'd read Solis, you'd read Oslin. It was the same names over and over, right? So I was shocked over the past month and, and, and even a little bit longer, all these names I had never heard of were writing about Japan and the U.S. So first, of course, I get very upset about that. You know, who are they to write about Japan? And then I realized what a huge change this was and more importantly, what it meant. What it meant was that for all of us who worked on Japan and have worked on Japan for so long, you know, of course we know it's important. We've, we've dedicated our lives to it. Many of us have lived there, on and on. All of a sudden, these other folks who have written about all sorts of other things were now beginning to focus uh, on the relationship. And, and I think we hit a, a peak of that uh, with the, uh, the meeting between President Biden and Prime Minister Kishida. Uh, and every op-ed, uh, every editorial that I was seeing was all about you know, Japan now entering the geopolitical game or, or Japan stepping up or you know, things that we all knew that Japan had been doing, but had broken through in, to the consciousness of the broader security community. So I think that's actually very important. What I think it is is actually a challenge for us. Um, it's a challenge first because we know Japan better, quite honestly. And so there's a bigger role now in educating people who are paying attention to the relationship that didn't before. And that's why this particularly is so important and, and why Satu and the team are to be congratulated for it, as they always are, but I think even at a more important time uh, than, than before. So that's number one. Number two is that it actually raises, raises the danger level, I think, right? It's, it's easy uh, to have a great partnership when that partnership sort of goes along on autopilot, when there's not a lot of challenges for it, when it doesn't enter into contested territory, whether physical or, or political uh, and, and the like. When a relationship now is at the forefront of all of the, the core security concerns that we have, then it becomes a really serious business. And the potential for uh, misunderstanding, mismatched expectations rises exponentially. And so again, for those of us who work on Japan, I think it's even more important to find partners like we've seen from the representatives and, and congressmen who are here today, to work with all of them so that we don't get into a situation where all of a sudden there's, there's an expectation that Tokyo will do something that it's not prepared to do or that we're going to do something that, that we're not prepared to do. So I think this is an incredibly exciting moment, but it's actually a moment that in some ways you could almost say we've all been training for, for a long time, right? We've been waiting for this moment. We had to wait through the Cold War. We had to wait through the War on Terror. We had to wait through you know, 20 years of, of engagement in the Middle East. Now is, now is that moment, but now, because the, the, the cards are all out and the chips are all on the table, we have to be even more serious and rigorous in what we bring to talking about it and thinking where it goes forward, whether it's Japan trying to engage more with the AUKUS uh, trio, uh, whether we say, what, where is the quad actually going and is it going to live up to the expectations that it has? Or quite honestly, if we begin to, to take uh, seriously red lines that we've drawn about things like Taiwan, what concretely is Tokyo ready to do and what will we expect of it and vice versa? I don't have any question, uh, any answers to those questions. I'm not sure any of us do yet, but I do know that after a very long time of just sort of thinking about it, now it's time to be acting on it. And so I'll be waiting to listen to the advice of, of my colleagues here who will give us the answers. So thank you. Thanks very much, Misha. This issue of expectation management is a really important one. Let's invite Kome Isozaki for our 
who has served in the Ministry of Defense and now is at the Hudson Institute as a Japan Chair Fellow. Come Thank you, East West Center and the Sasaga Peace Foundation for inviting me to this uh, great panel. Um, so I, frankly speaking, at 10 years old, I was uh, in Washington, D.C. as a similar uh, capacity, and I was uh, rather pessimistic about Japan was declining and China was rising. And everybody is talking about China is a U.S. partners, uh, G2s. Uh, Japan was economy was uh, really uh, stagnant for many decades. Um, but the importance of uh, Japan has not diminished. Um, so Satu, um, I met Satu probably 10 years ago in Washington, D.C., and uh, he uh, showed me the, the booklet of Japan Matters for America, America Matters for Japan. Um, so uh, I saw the figures. I, I was very impressed that the Japan still matters and uh, could be more important in the futures. And looking at the history of the uh, ten uh, last decade, it's uh, Japan is in, is still increasing the importance and particularly the, the effectiveness of uh, and usefulness of the U.S.-Japan alliance is has been increasing. Um, so the last month was a sort of uh, people say. Japanuary, so a lot of Japanese related events, US Japan uh, summits, uh, two plus two meetings. And the last December, we saw uh, new uh, issues of uh, three strategy documents uh, in, in Tokyo. Uh, that was, uh, I think, uh, very impressed and also sometimes even surprised to see how grave Japan's security recognition is about international order. Uh, so, so I have seen that this printed out uh, every document, uh, 30 some pages. They, it's a very thick document. It's very hard to read all, <laughs> actually. But um, so I saw, I remember that uh, there are several uh, phrases uh, impressed me that, um, <clears throat> so this is the most serious era uh, since the end of World War II. They use uh, those terms several times. So I think, uh, so Japan's uh, notion of international order, it was uh, free and open in the Pacific was at stake. Uh, and they uh, said also intensifying geopolitical competitions. So very competitions are uh, uh, increasing of the relatively stable order, even though we experienced the Cold War, but it was uh, superpowers uh, maintained the balance. And uh, from the Japanese point of view, it was relatively stable. We are part of uh, the US partners, but now it's um, the pillar is moving, shifting. So we don't know which way we are going. So we, we have seen the member of the United Nations are outright invaded the neighbors. And then we've seen the other big countries also uh, intensify the gray zone challenges in, in the East and South China seas. And we see, we don't see any stabilities. Um, so based on those notions and the Japanese uh, documents uh, wrote a lot of uh, I think it's most fundamental transformation of the Japanese security policy uh, in the past maybe 70 years. Uh, so uh, it's a doubling defense budget, which had been considered impossible, but it's now it's declared by 2027. Also, uh, counter strike capabilities, uh, which it was interpreted in 1956. I think uh, Japanese government explained to the Diet members. Uh, the, in the sessions that the, this is constitutional, Japan has the counter strike, uh, big strike capabilities. It's constitutional. So the interpretation has not changed, but the Japan's as a policy renounced acquiring such capabilities. But now Japan is now declared that Japan need to have a counter strike capability to strengthen the de deterrence to face the, uh, the current international environments. So those uh, the document is uh, the two parts are defense related issues, but there they covered a lot of issues from the uh, how to strengthen the social uh, strengths, uh, infrastructures, uh, intellectual uh, parts, also the uh, defense industrial uh, parts. And so those very wide ranging issues are uh, written. So those strategic documents, I think, are very fundamental, also uh, important. But um, so I say this is a very successful to formulating these strategic documents under the context of the U.S.-Japan alliance as well. So, um, so right after the issuance, that it, it was good to have a bilateral meetings and, and then uh, confirmed and embraced by the United States. It was good things. 
but in, in the future we have to uh, I think more challenges exist to how to implement these uh, broad strategic uh, policies. These policies require not just money but the cooperation with the people like who are here today or may, maybe more broader. So uh, implementations of uh, strategy is is the challenge. We have to work harder in the future. Thank you very much. We now turn to our good friend and colleague, uh, J uh, James Schoff, who also has previously served in the U.S. government at the Pentagon. He's the director of the U.S.-Japan Next Alliance Initiative. So over to you. It's great to be here with you. Thank you, and congratulations on the, the publication. Um, I'll stick with the theme of wonkiness uh, here and say that I, you know, I would put the 2 plus 2 that occurred in January in the top four of 2 plus 2s that the alliance has had, because that's we keep track of things like that here. Um, 95, certainly the first time you ever had uh, all cabinet members as members of the 2 plus 2 and, and set, the, uh, uh, set the stage for the joint declaration on security that Clinton and Hashimoto signed in 96 that launched into situations and areas surrounding Japan and a whole different kind of uh, realm of security cooperation in the alliance. 2005-2006 uh, with the realignment roadmap launch, and then of course 2015 the revision of the defense guidelines that, that we have now. This is similar in importance, um, I think, and and why that is, is because it's reckoning with two very uncomfortable realities uh, that have been there for a while, but but now I think, you know, have really uh, reached to the forefront. The first is that Japan is not a rear area state when it comes to security in the region. It is on the front line uh, because of the way uh, nations are behaving and the technology uh, that they possess. So if there's a conflict, Japan is going to be on the on the front lines of a conflict. And a conflict, the second reality is, is, is more likely than it has been in, in, in recent memory. Um, that doesn't mean it's imminent or it's, uh, it's a foregone conclusion, but it's, it's the kind of thing that now I think this 2 plus 2 and Japan's defense strategy is, is taking, the alliance is taking practical steps to improve the way that they can handle the situation and try to deter conflict. Because the goal is still peace and stability in the region. The role for the alliance is deterrence to help achieve that goal. Um, in addition to common prosperity in the region, but that's where the economic folks will take uh, on the next panel uh, to talk about that. So these practical steps are the mar Marine Littoral Regiment that uh, Dazdi Mohandas uh, referred to, counter-strike capability, Japan developing a permanent joint headquarters, um, a security a supply arrangement between our two countries so that we can share various types of, of munitions and, and equipment and, and uh, inputs. And uh, what was referenced also, uh, oh, establishment of a water transport company uh, in Japan. It sounds like, you know, some company that's going to make canoes or something like that. But uh, and it and it barely got any uh, description. But this is uh, a, a collection of ships that are in in Yokohama today. These are U.S. transport ships. The U.S. Army runs and they're very capable at moving men and material. Uh, but we've never had people there to necessarily operate them. They were just there in case there was some kind of need for them in the future. Now we're going to move 200 or so uh, U.S. Army personnel there to be there full time to train with the Japanese. These ships will be able to move both American and Japanese uh, uh, soldiers and, and materiel. It's practical preparation to be better prepared to strengthen deterrence so that we don't have to, to fight a war and support uh, peace and stability in the region. All of this is going to place new demands on command and control within the alliance. The traditional role of U.S. Forces Japan is simply a manager of bases, while Indo-PACOM or PACOM was the operational partner for Japan. How is that going to work if Japan is on the front lines and we're becoming more integrated in our uh, missions in counter-strike and supply and logistics and intelligence sharing, et cetera? So th this next coming year um, and beyond, the roles and missions discussion that Dazdi Mohan just talked about is going to be on the Alliance agenda to try to figure out how do we adapt? We don't have to wholesale change it, perhaps, but how will this permanent joint headquarters in Japan interact with Indo-PACOM? Do you bring port part of it forward? Do you bring it there full time part of the time? Do you bring part of the Japan piece to uh, Hawaii? These are all things that are going to need to be discussed. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's the significance uh, of, of what has been agreed to and has been alluded to, the implementation is still 
uh, yet to come. I think Japan is still struggling with how will this permanent joint headquarters uh, look? What will its role be? What is, it, what is its role in comparison to the joint staff uh, office that's there now? They'll have to differentiate this and justify it to the Ministry of Finance, uh, who has to pay these different salaries. Um, so that will be an area uh, of discussion. Certainly the counter-strike piece, um, they talk about wanting to buy a whole lot of Tomahawk missiles, but uh, that's got to get through Congress. And, uh, you know, is it going to be 100, 200, 300, or 400 uh, missiles? There's a lot to discuss uh, on that front. And then the access, being able to move and be mobile around the Southwest Islands and around um, both Japanese and U.S. forces is still, as, as you all know, uh, a, a big political hurdle uh, to overcome uh, with, uh, with Okinawan residents as well. Uh, so we're, we're on the same page, but uh, there's still a lot of um, issues that we need to, uh, to, to, to tackle. Uh, and the defense budget is another piece of that as well. The, the plan to uh, increase taxes potentially to sustain um, higher defense spending in Japan over the longer term is not a clear cut or a slam dunk uh, by any stretch. So. Um, I'm optimistic for the alliance in terms of where we are now, but there's certainly uh, a lot of uh, a lot of work ahead. And uh, you know, I'm glad that we have uh, people up here, people in the audience, and uh, tools like uh, the publication um, being launched today to to help support that and sustain the political support for the alliance as well. Thank thank you, thank you very much, Jim. It, it's it's it's. Remarkable, and I think it started out with Misha saying about where you know where we are today after watching a period where we kind of heard some of the same debates and same issues, and Jim ending on the note of all the new issues that we now have to grapple with in the alliance, and in a way, it's an extraordinarily challenging time and exciting time for the alliance. But I think it underscores again the points that were made earlier about the vital importance of the U.S.-Japan alliance and security relationship not just for each other and our bilateral alliance, but really now for what Ambassador, Ambassador Tomita said is our partnership for the world, because this will matter for not just for the Indo-Pacific region, but for the inter, entire international order. Um, let me invite the next panel up as we, uh, as we move through our, um, our, this discussion program, the fireside chat program. And this next session is on US-Japan relationship economics. Again, we talk a lot in the, bi in the publication on bilateral, but here again, the relationship is not only bilateral, but critical to the region and critical to the world between the first and third largest economies. And we have an extremely stellar group of um, panelists to speak to us on this. We have um, in this order, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Asia at the International Trade Administration, Pamela Fan is joining us. Thank you so much for being here, um, um, Deputy Assistant Secretary. We also have Tomoko uh, Hosaka Malani, Executive Director of the U.S.-Japan Business Council. Thank you so much for joining us. And of course, many of you will know Dr. Medea Solis, Director of the Center for East Asia Policy Studies at the Brookings Institution, who writes extensively and is a real expert on not only U.S.-Japan bilateral relations, but sort of Japan's economic statecraft at a critical time. So let me invite um, Ms. Fan, perhaps, to lead us off with Maybe some comments on the U.S.-Japan uh, economic relationship and how you see it. Sure. Happy to do so. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I want to echo all the congratulations to the East-West Center and to the Sasakawa Peace Foundation for this tremendously important report uh, that comes at such a, an important time. Um, as Satu has mentioned, I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Asia at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Um, in this role, my portfolio basically spans from Pakistan to the Pacific Islands. Um, the only piece that is excluded from my portfolio is mainland PRC. Um, and Japan certainly is a, a critical piece um, of the day-to-day -day work that our organization does. Um, we have senior commercial officers on the ground in 17 markets all across Asia, um, about 50 plus U.S. citizens who operate as our commercial officers. Um, and they are supported by almost 200 locally employed staff who are um, our real connections to the businesses and to the governments on the ground in these markets. Um, 
There is, of course, an economic case for why it's so important to partner with Japan. Um, we've heard about it being the third largest economy, the United States' fourth largest trading partner, number one when it comes to FDI into the United States and also being a recipient of U.S. FDI. Um, but there is also, importantly, a uh, national security case for why it's so important to partner with Japan economically. Um, I want to do a little bit of framing of the Japan economic relationship within the broader geopolitical outlook. Um, in Asia, you know, certainly the PRC's reprioritization away from economic growth towards national security um, and its assertive military behavior have have caused us to rethink how it is that we protect our national security interests while also sustaining and expanding what's already significant trade and investment interests in the region. Um, add to that the effects of Russia's war with Ukraine um, on the energy and food supply, and this has brought into further focus um, how important it is to cooperate with like-minded partners when it comes to addressing today's modern threats, uh, threats to our global economy, and working together to really stabilize beyond our shores. Um, We've rethought our economic priorities, and you know, right now they really include four things: ensuring that the U.S. builds the talent, the technologies, and the manufacturing capabilities that are necessary for us to to lead the global economy into the 21st century. Um, number two, ensuring that we have a workforce that is trained with the education um, and the skills that are necessary to compete for the jobs of the 21st century. Um, number three, safeguarding our national security and de democratic values while we do all of this. Um, and number four, growing our presence and our influence around the world. This, these priorities have led to a strategy that has four components. Um, the first component is making sure that there are transformational investments in American innovation. Um, obviously, America can't win if it doesn't innovate and remain ahead of global competitors. Secondly, we've got to bolster our domestic capabilities from infrastructure to STEM education to ensure that our country has the physical um, and people resources that are needed to build for the future. Number three, we have to partner with allies um, in new ways to advance our shared values and to shape the strategic environment. And finally, we have got to advocate for US trade and investment and the benefits that come with us. Um, so this brings me to what we are doing, especially at the Department of Commerce with Japan. We have a number of um, multilateral fora through which we cooperate with Japan. Um, things that have been mentioned earlier this evening, this afternoon, from the Quad um, to the um, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation or APEC to um, IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Framework um, for Prosperity. But most importantly, we have our bilateral engagement with the Japanese. Um, the Department of Commerce and our counterpart, the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry in Japan, has um, a, a bilateral dialogue that focuses on four work streams, semiconductor supply chains, export controls, the digital economy, and trade and investment. Um, our experts, our technical um, Specialists in each of these areas are working together on a regular basis to talk about how the two countries can work together in these areas to advance our shared goals. And this feeds into um, the economic two plus two. We talked earlier today about the geostrategic, the political military two plus two. There is an economic two plus two as well that is co led by the Department of Commerce and the Department of State. Um, and through the economic two plus two, we are um, reporting out um, to a strategy that is designed to ensure that the United States and Japan are working together um, as partners, allies, like-minded to ensure that there is peace and prosperity throughout the region. Um, we actually had our first ministerial meeting of the economic two plus two back in July of last year. Um, and it was timely because it followed just a couple months after Japan had released its economic security promotion law. Mm -hmm. And the United States had finally passed our Chips and Science Act of 2022. Um, and so 
with these monumental um, pieces of legislation and the policy shifts that um, they help to inform, you know, we are ensuring that the two plus two is a forum to think strategically about our bilateral relationship and about the broader region, the broader economy um, in all of these respects. Um, I will pause there um, and pass it back to you, Satu. Thanks, Pamela. That That's terrific. And I particularly appreciate you flagging the, the two plus two on the economic side and how our domestic legislation in both countries is now, you know, the Economic Promotion Act in Japan and, and our CHIPS Act and others are helping to shape and guide our uh, national security as well as our overall bilateral economic relationship. Ms. Mulaney, can I turn to you, please? Speak a little bit about the corporate and business yeah, aspect. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Um, really uh, want to thank the East West Center and the Sasaka Peace Foundation for this very important report. Um, really thrilled to be here alongside such distinguished colleagues. Um, I think the report does a very nice job of laying out some of the incredible kind of data and the numbers that really highlight the the deep um, and important economic relationship between the two countries. Um, you know, some some of the 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 numbers that jumped out at me: bilateral trade in goods and services, total estimated two hundred seventy nine billion dollars every year, and um, also more than sixteen hundred American companies operate eighty six hundred subsidiaries in Japan. In Japan. Um, so I'm I'm here to talk um, a little bit about the U.S. Japan economic relationship from the perspective of somebody who represents U.S. companies operating in Japan, and to give you kind of step back a little bit to give you a little bit of a brief organization of my organization. Um, the U.S. Japan Business Council is housed within the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Um, we are the lar world's largest business association, representing companies of all sizes every, across every sector of the economy. Um, the chamber has the largest international program of any U.S. association. We're active at 130 countries, and we run 20 bilateral business councils, working to advance commercial relations between the U.S. and key markets around the globe, including Japan. Mm. And so the U.S.-Japan Business Council um, is, is one of those bilateral councils. It's comprised of more than 65 leading U.S. companies, and we are led by um, our chairman, Douglas Peterson, who's the president and CEO of S&P Global, and our vice chair, David Geckler, who's the CEO of Western Digital. And the USJBC is the largest US-based organization re representing American companies that do business in Japan. And our members really are at the center of the US-Japan economic relationship. And one of the things that makes us a little bit unique, we think, we like to think, is that we have a really strong institutional relationship with our Japanese counterpart group, which is the Japan US Business Council, which is the JUBC, and they are housed within Keidanen. And they're um, comprised of approximately 85 leading Japanese companies. And we do a lot of work together. Um, we have five sectoral joint working groups in digital economy, energy and infrastructure, financial services, healthcare innovation, and travel, tourism, and transportation. And together, we seek to find common ground with, um, with, with our Japanese counterparts and make policy recommendation to both governments. And then we also jointly host the U.S.-Japan Business Conference every year. This year, it will be held in Tokyo on October 3rd and 4th. And we will be celebrating a big milestone. It's the 60th anniversary of the conference. So we are um, really looking forward to making it a big celebration of our two countries' longstanding economic relationship. Um, so I want to kind of touch now on, on a few of our top priorities and opportunities um, from, from the standpoint of the U.S. business community. Um, you know, um, we talked a lot about security and defense, and certainly it's very important. But... Um, at USJBC, we strongly believe that strengthening the bilateral economic relationship is an absolute necessary element of a closer and more secure U.S.-Japan partnership. Um, you know, we welcome the, the cooperative frameworks and dialogues that have been established, um, you know, Economic 2 plus 2. Um, there's the Japan-U.S. Commercial and Industrial Partnership, JUSIP, and the, kind of the larger dialogues as well, like, like IPEF. Um, but the, the USJBC really would like to see even more sustained focus on our bilateral economic relationship particularly on the trade and investment front. Um, our mutual goal should be to make our economic relationship even stronger by expanding two-way trade and investment opportunities, supporting economic growth and security, and promoting innovation. And the last point about innovation um, is particularly important for our member companies. Uh, promoting really strong innovation ecosystems in dynamic industries is a top priority for us. And working together to ensure policy coherence um, kind of alignment between policy goals and specific measures across all ministries that supports dynamic innovation e ecosystems and transparency, predictability, and fairness in the regulatory process is absolutely critical. 
And we see a few um, key opportunities in the years ahead for strengthening this, this collaboration. Um, certainly the, the increased cooperation and coordination in the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance um, really opens up opportunities for the private sector to, to work with both governments as they develop new initiatives and programs. And then um, the, the deepening policy alignment on economic security issues, including supply chain resilience, um, protecting critical advanced technologies, energy security, cybersecurity, um, and kind of a few points I'd like to make on this front is, you know, as, as Japan undertakes new policy initiative to support its economic security, we really um, want to ensure that U.S. companies are viewed as full partners and have opportunities to participate in meaningful ways. And this includes things like procurement opportunities, incentives and subsidies in line with WTO rules and our existing bilateral agreements, um, and this new spirit of cooperation and economic integration. And concurrently, we um, support and advocate for the same treatment of Japanese companies in the United States, many of whom are key contributors to U.S. economic health and employment. And then third, um, just the expansion of the digital economy, digital infrastructure, and digital sorry, digitalization in Japan um, is another you know, key opportunity for our, our members. Um, you know, Japan aspires to become a leader in the digital economy and um, you know, we, we applaud the government of Japan's um, um, efforts to make greater investments in top areas of focus, like such as semiconductors, um, Internet of Things technology, AI robotics. Um, and, you know, these initiatives present really major opportunities for U.S. companies to expand or introduce their footprint in Japan. And kind of speaking of digital, I want to I'm going to go back to IPEF a little bit um, and kind of um, acknowledge that. Um, you know, many corporate leaders remain pretty kind of rather skeptical of IPEF and that that it will actually lead to economic growth because there's no market access component of it. And the chamber has been extremely vocal in saying that we need to raise our ambitions for IPEF to include things like tariff elimination and market access, as well as binding and enforceable rules in key areas such as di digital trade. Um, and we believe that central to IPEF should be enforceable digital trade language building on the U.S.-Japan Digital Trade Agreement or the digital trade chapter of the USMCA. Um, and such a chapter would include things like, you know, a ban on forced localization of data, um, guarantees that firms will be able to move data across borders, and a prohibition on government requirements to access source code, among other priorities. Uh, we think these rules should apply to all sectors of the economy without exception. So with that, um, I'll wrap up and kind of pass the baton over to Maria. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Ms. Maloney. Great to have a business perspective. <laughs> Maria, you want to talk about some of the global pressures, regional pressures driving U.S.-Japan? Uh, uh, yes, of course. My pleasure. And uh, thank you, Satu. And first, I want to congratulate the East-West Center and the Sagawa Peace Foundation for the publication of the fourth edition of the Japan Matters for America, America Matters for Japan. This has become a go-to reference for both experts and the general public. And I think it accomplishes something very rare. That is, it captures the many dimensions of this important bilateral relationship, but in a way that is very easy to understand and convey. And believe me, for someone who works on producing many graphs and tables, this is not an easy thing to do. So uh, kudos for that. Now, um, the basic message I want to um, uh, emphasize today in these very short remarks, because I understand there are refreshments and that in, the longer I talk, the longer it takes for all of us to um, move to the next panel. And then there... you mean beer or wine? <laughs> <laughs> I, I will not specify which ones. Uh, but um, that there has been profound change in the U.S.-Japan uh, relationship, certainly when it comes to the economic field. And uh, this relationship now matters more and matters more for the right reasons. Uh, Japan has been in the radar of the United States for a very long time. And I would say that in the past, not necessarily for the best of reasons, and I'm talking about the era of trade friction, where economics was an, a divisive issue and not one where you had the two countries partnering to advance shared goals. And therefore, that has changed quite dramatically. And the United States and Japan now have developed a habit of working together to develop new rules on trade and investment and try to disseminate them throughout the region and globally. 
And uh, in, importantly, we see these relationships continue to evolve and to tackle the most pressing challenges. And the previous speakers have already made reference to these new tracks that have to do with supply chain uh, resilience, that have to do with um, how to deal with economic coercion, that have to do with how we generate new innovation, how we protect critical infrastructure and a critical uh, technology. So what I'm trying to tell you is that we have moved from economics to geoeconomics in the U.S.-Japan relationship. And what this means is that foreign economic policies of both Japan and the United States have greater alignment, greater uh, opportunity for uh, shared uh, cooperation. But as we heard in the security panel, this also carries many uh, 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 difficulties in implementing, operationalizing these new areas of joint effort. The other element that I would like to highlight is that as the United States and Japan work more closely in foreign economic policy, they're going to first and foremost be influencing the Indo-Pacific region, which happens to be the one area of the world that is growing the most rapidly, that houses the majority of the global middle class, where you have uh, the U.S. peer competitor rising and becoming an important economic magnet, and therefore an area that really captures a whole uh, set of uh, crucial interests for the United States and Japan. And therefore, this is a, diplom uh, a diplomatic effort, a coordination effort that matters greatly for both uh, countries. And I would like to just to give a little bit more of uh, uh, detail to what I'm trying to portray here. Uh, uh, highlight very briefly what is at stake on two fronts where I see the United States and Japan are working more uh, closely together, regional economic diplomacy and economic uh, security. So let me start with the regional economic uh, architecture. And I start by saying that this year is going to be a very consequential year because Japan holds the presidency of the G7 and the United States is also leading the process in the APEC. So this creates the opportunity as this, uh, the United States and Japan are chairing this uh, really important international fora to identify an economic agenda, a foreign economic policy, where there can be synergy uh, between what each one is doing uh, in these uh, different uh, settings. And uh, very much uh, um, um, uh, doubling down on some of the elements highlighted before, I think that the di digital economy is a central area of interest. Uh, because there's great importance, uh, it, the drive towards digitalization is unstoppable, but we don't have good rules uh, of international governance on the digital economy. Mm -hmm. Quite the opposite. What we have is a fragmented uh, set of idiosyncratic rules, and uh, there is this model of Chinese digital protectionism that if we don't get our act together, it's going to disseminate uh, further. And therefore, it's very important for Japan in the G7 to advance uh, enforceable rules for the freedom of data flows and for the United States to also push for ambitious outcomes as part of the Indo-Pacific economic framework so that that could be an early deliverable by uh, November when the leaders uh, will meet um, for the APEC uh, summit. Now, when we talk about trade, we frequently, and I'm guilty of that, mm -hmm. emphasize where the United States and Japan are not yet fully on board. And that is, of course, the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. And we heard Prime Minister Kishida, the one ask he had of President Biden in the policy speech he gave at size uh, just a few weeks ago was for the United States to return to the CPTPP. But whether the United States is ready or not and when it will be, regardless of that, I think we should not lose sight of the fact that the fact that the United States and Japan cooperated in the regional TPP has had profound impact that continues today. And I say that because the survivor agreement, the CPTPP, very much embodies a set of principles, rules, and standards that the United States has championed. And they live on in this trade agreement that is growing. And because some of these rules were also incorporated in the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement. So they also shape the way in which the United States deals with these very important trading partners. And because many of these rules will be uh, points of reference in the ongoing Indo-Pacific economic uh, framework. So this then is important work that uh, continues. And uh, one observation, because I've spoken too long, on the economic security agenda. 
And here, there are two sides to economic security. There's the promotion side, where you have now governments and industry thinking about how can we have a more focused effort to nurture the technologies of today and the future. And then there's a protection side to diminish vulnerabilities to the risks of economic interdependence. And we see Japan and the United States really uh, opening a very robust dialogue on this. And this uh, has been captured in the phrase competitiveness and resilience. These are the two sides of economic security, and they have become uh, um, a way in which the United States plan, think, and try to operationalize new initiatives. And in one important sector alone, I can highlight the potential semiconductors. The uh, complementarity in the semiconductor supply chain is very clear. The United States lead on design and software. Japan leads on advanced materials and production equipment. There are now new initiatives to uh, launch new uh, joint research and development on the cutting edge of nano chips. And Japan recently, and I don't have the details, and certainly over a beer, maybe I can ask for some details. Uh, Japan has joined uh, the US effort on the recent export control rule um, that uh, focuses on uh, cutting edge chips on AI and supercomputing. And we know that unilateral US export control rules are never going to be as effective as a coordinated effort with its closest allies. So uh, getting there is not easy. We have not seen the uh, the details of how Japan is going to approach this, but certainly it's promising. And I would close just by saying that what's really important here is that this alliance, has, this relationship has become very important because it continues to evolve in a way in which is now tackling new challenges. And I think that that will certainly be captured in the future iterations of this report, and I'm looking forward to that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Thank you very much. You know, this this the point you made about U.S. Um, the living on some of the principles that we want in TPP is really important. I, I don't know if you've seen the new IMF report on geoeconomic fragmentation, yeah. but in that spirit, the U.S.-Japan relationship really must be a ballast in this time of fragmentation to create some coherence and order in the system. And I am looking forward to all of your continued support in your various government and private sector and and um, and and your intellectual ways in shaping policy discussions and debates. Thank you. And we're going to just transition to the final panel, which is on this critical issue of people to people relationship. And we have with us two really superb uh, speakers on this. Uh, Paige Cottingham Streeter is the ex executive director of the Japan US Friendship Commission and uh, board chair of the US Japan Exchange and Teaching Alumni Association. And Emma Chandler Avery from the Congressional Research Service who's the vice chair for the board of trustees at the National Association of Japan America Societies. We've heard throughout this program about the importance of the people to people relationship. And I just wanna give you a chance because both of you <laughs> have been so critical, <laughs> yeah, so critical to expanding the people to people relationship through the work of your two organizations. So I want you to maybe tell us where do we go from here given all that's already going on in the relationship what do we need to do more? Um, what do you think we're doing well? And where are some opportunities as we go forward? I'm Emma Chandler Davy. I work at the Congressional Research Service. Um, so I focus a lot on US Japan policy. Um, and I know we're supposed to look forward, mm -hmm. but if I could just for a second, I know you this is not like, you know, an autobiographical talk, but I think that my experience is is um uh, an example of how people to people ties really work. Mm -hmm. Um I went to Japan first when I was 16 years old on a six week um, exchange called the US Japan Senate Scholarship Exchange, <laughs> known as Juicy. Um, and it was an all expenses paid. This is in the 90s. Um, and um, the, US, the Japanese government paid for two students from every state um, to go and spend six weeks in Japan. I lived on a farm in West Virginia. I had never gone overseas before. I had never gotten a passport before. Um, so this really was my introduction to the broader world. And I spent um, six weeks living in Wakayama Prefecture um, in a, like, a, with um, Buddhist priests. Um, the whole family was Jodo Shinshu Buddhist priests, and we lived attached to the temple. So it obviously blew my world open um, from that. And that led me to study Japanese um, when I got to college. And it led me to join the um, Japan America Student Conference, JASC, um, where I made lifelong friends that I still see all the time. 
Um, I went and taught um, English at Doshishi University after I graduated um, because the Amherst College, my alma mater, has a special relationship with Niji Majosan, the founder of Doshisha. Um, so it obviously, in Kyoto for a year, was wonderful. Um, so it really um, obviously created my path and the reason that I work on Japan today. Um, and so I do the policy stuff um, while I'm, you know, as my day job, but I've gotten involved in the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C., um, the vice chair of that board. And um, just two years ago, I guess, um, became the vice chair of the National Association of Japan America Societies. Um, and that's been so rewarding because, you know, while I have to be critical in my reports and talk about strains in the alliance, um, when I get to travel occasionally domestically, there's 38 different societies um, throughout the United States. Um, and there, some of them are tiny, all voluntary, you know, um, and some of them are, are, are bigger with a lot of staff like New York. Um, but uh, to just see people who are just it's not policy centric. It's, um, you know, it's just people who love Japan. Um, I mean, it's, and it's everything from, I visited this tiny little Japanese garden in Alabama that was somehow this guy got permission to put it on a state park. And then I went to a Dallas event where we talked about supply chain issues um, and, and uh, the, all the companies that are based around Dallas. Um, so it's given me a much more sort of expanded appreciation um, of how the United States and Japan are interlinked and, and, and the real grassroots passion that exists there. Um, so in terms of going forward, I mean, um, you know, unfortunately, particularly because of Japan's really stringent border controls mm -hmm. during the pandemic, um, you know, a lot of those person to person exchanges were suspended. Um, so I think we do have some catch up work to do. I mean, it's almost like we missed like a little mini generation mm -hmm. of people um, because students weren't let in, you know, I mean, if you got somebody who wants to learn Japanese, you got to go to Japan. Mm. Um, and, and a lot of students were not able to do that, which was, um, so we have some, some catching up to do. Um, but I think that the passion is there. I think that we have the drive um, at the national political level now, too. I mean, we see all of these changes going on in terms of Japan's um, changing defense policy. So I think that there's... Um, there's a stronger and stronger interest in Japan, somewhat driven by our rising strategic, very driven by our rising strategic competition with China. Um, but um, you know, join your local um, Japan America Society. Um, Brian is right here as the president of uh, the DC chapter. Go to the Sakura Matsuri because um, those things are, I think, really what sustain this relationship beyond just you know the two plus two dialogues that are still very important. Thanks, Emma, especially because your personal along with your professional work on Japan is such a great example of the people to people element. So thank you. And we'll be coming to you for advice on where to do some of rollout programs on J Japan Matters for America across the US. We're kind of looking at various options and we'd love to get your input. Let me turn to Paige, who's had a long time experience in Japan as well, both personally and professionally. Paige, you wanna talk about some of the work your agency is doing to promote people to people ties? Sure, um, I'd love to. Um, and Satu, on behalf of the Japan US Friendship Commission, thank you so much um, for everybody involved in launching this um, Japan Matters, the Japan US Friendship Commission, and also congratulations to our friends at the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. I know it's a collaborative effort and it's really um, important for a variety of reasons. I am sitting here wearing today two hats, um, I am the executive director of the Japan US Friendship Commission. We are a federal agency. Not everybody realizes that in the United States, we have one agency dedicated to a single bilateral relationship, which speaks to why Japan matters mm. uh, to the US and the US matters to Japan because of the importance of the relationship. Um, it's also a grant making agency, which means that we have the opportunity to provide funding to support institutions, including Japan America Societies, the US Japan Student Conference, previously US Japan Student Conference, now International Student Conference. Um, and we've supported the East West Center in the past and a number of other um, programs that are specifically designed to promote Japan studies. The study about the United States and Japan, American studies, American studies in Japan, sorry, the other way around. Um, and also people to people exchange as well as policy dialogues. 
And it's all with the idea of making sure that there is visibility on the value and the importance of the U.S.-Japan relationship, and to also make sure that at every level of society, there is engagement, um, there's knowledge and understanding so that we can strengthen that relationship. And so for me, it's just a pleasure to be able to be a part of seeing the sustainability of these organizations so they can do the important work they're doing. I'm also a proud alumna of the JET program. And so I call myself in that first generation. I know there are other JET alum in this room and uh, some of our previous panelists served on the JET program. Some of you in the audience were on the JET program and we are here because we are engaged in Japan at some level. And that's the point that I really want to make. Emma talked about her personal story. There are so many people that have been exposed to Japan and intrigued by Japan and from the Japanese community and Japanese society who are intrigued by the United States and decided to build a career around understanding not just the country better, but also finding a way to contribute to the management of the relationship. And so what I've appreciated about the data that you provided in the um, publication is that you not only talk about where we are today, but acknowledge that there has been this history and this steady progress of um, engagement between the two countries. I was proud to be a part of the Friendship Blossoms Initiative. So those cherry trees that were planted some hundred plus years ago, the reciprocal gift was dogwood trees. Yes. And that happened thanks to the strong network of sister city relationships. Mm -hmm. So those 431 sister cities that you talked about are in another important web and network. So I would say going forward, we need to tap into the high interest among Americans about Japan. And we need to make sure that we have a next generation of people who are going to be those managers, the people who are gonna be at this table having a dialogue with other people like you. And in order to do that though, we really do have to make sure that there's funding available. And I'm just going to put it on the table because the Japan US Commit Friendship Commission is one of less than a handful of institutions, Japanese or American that have the resources to be able to make the kind of investment that's gotten us this far. Mm. So the Japanese government has generously funded the JET program. Um, and then there have been other organizations that the commission have supported, the Japan Foundation, Sasakawa Peace Foundation. They're just launching, um, as Aya Murata mentioned, a new initiative to provide scholarships, which is fantastic. But we have to make sure we continue to invest in the long-term sustainability of the US-Japan partnership by investing in the people and particularly the young people who are going to be engaged not only in security and trade, but those STEM fields and the technological fields and the space cooperation and everything else that we know is so critical, important to the bilateral relationship, the Indo-Pacific region and the larger global community. Thank you so much, Paige. As you can see, both Emma and Paige are really terrific examples, living examples of why Japan matters for America and America matters for Japan. And they build their professional and personal experiences. In my case too, I mean, uh, I many decades ago um, had an opportunity to go to Japan for 10 months for a program. And I was in a completely different field. I was in the nuclear energy business and a Middle East specialist, uh, worked on Lebanon and Israel. And those 10 months became three and a half years and completely changed the trajectory of my life in professionally, um, to some extent personally as well. And so I, I just want to reiterate that that this people-to-people -people connection with Japan, especially at a time for reasons that Mireya and our economic panel and our security panel explain, is now a really critical time. And I tell people unashamedly, uh, young folks who come to me for advice, you know, should I study this or go to that school or law school or grad school, I'm always saying, Please think about Japan because sometimes other issues in other countries get a lot of attention. And I keep saying that the relationship with Japan is going to be ever more important and critical to the United States. So I'll close with saying thank you for joining us 
thank you to the Sasakawa Foundation, a Peace Foundation, for their really more than a decade of support for this initiative and for this project. We're now getting ready to do go on the road, hopefully both across the United States and Japan. And Ambassador Tomita has already given us kind of a hint for the next iteration to look at the Japan-US relationship in the context of our partnership with the world. So we'll look at that. And finally, in addition to thanking our partners, thank all of you for taking the time. Thank you to my boss, uh, Major General Vera Slum, for being here all the way from Hawaii, taking the time to attend this event. We thank you. And to our terrific team at the East West Center uh, that put out this publication along with the SPF team. Really thank you so very much. Have a great day. Be safe. Be well. Thank you. And thank you to Paige and Emma. <laughs>